why do cults start? Most people chalk it up to nothing more than an egotistical leader and gullible followers. But it's so much more complex than that. Floor Edwards, who grew up in the apocalyptic cult Children of God, knows that better than anyone. She was born into the cult in 1981 and spent her childhood preparing for the apocalypse in 1993. This is her story of hope, tragedy, mental health, and above all, healing. Flora Edwards, you're here. I am. Talk about your book. Yes, thank and you. And your unique life as someone who was born into and lived certainly the first 12 years of their life in a cult. Mm -hmm. And when a person who hasn't been in a cult hears mm -hmm. that word, mm -hmm. images of terror and brainwashing mm -hmm. uh, and fear and force mm -hmm. come up. Mm -hmm. What was your experience growing up in a cult? That's a, a pretty complex question. Um, the reason why I wrote the book was to give people an insight into, into a cult. And I think, like you said, people have this idea of what a cult is, and it, it definitely can be all of those things. <clears throat> but when I started to look back on my life, I started to see that there, there was a sense of normalcy to it as well, and I was, I was also a normal girl who wanted normal things. I did realize right away that I had grown up in quite an extraordinary circumstance. Um, that was something that I simply could not ignore. And as I started to realize that I had grown up in a cult, um, I realized that I absolutely had to tell my story. Mm -hmm. It was sort of, it wasn't even something I wanted to do, it was something I had to do. Mm -hmm. um, I had to sort of, in a way, leave a part of history. Um, as you can see, the media will constantly be telling the story in the way that they want to. Um, and I, I had to tell it my way from what I experienced growing up in it. Mm -hmm. How did the Children of God cult begin? Mm -hmm. um, so they started in 1968, mm -hmm. um, actually not far from here mm -hmm. on the shores of Huntington Beach. Um, Father David, I refer to him as Father David in the book, his name was David Brantberg. Um, he came from a long line of evangelists and um, uh, Christi Christian lineage. Um, he also had a history of ostracization, so kind of like rebellious um, Christians. And um, he adored his mother. He wanted to follow in her footsteps. He wanted to be a preacher. And he suffered from this conflict. Um, he had his own desires, and he also had this commitment to God. And he um, saw the hippie generation of the 1960s as sort of this ripe um, ground for him to preach his message. And he wanted to sort of shift the paradigm of the church that he knew so well. And so he adopted these beliefs. Um, free sexual beliefs was a big one. And um, sort of this new idea of who God was and what salvation was and how people could be saved. Um, how it was available to everyone. You didn't have to be good to be, you know, to be a believer of God. So that's sort of how the group started. Um, I always say it was quite humble. It was quite innocent in the beginning. The people who joined were not joining a cult. They were joining a movement. In the beginning, as I've said before, they even banned certain things. They banned drugs, alcohol, and even sex in the beginning. And then as it sort of developed and grew and kids started to come around, they had to sort of tighten their reins on us. And that's when control started to, to take, take play in it. Do you feel like the members of the Children of God having children is the reason then this group shifted to a more uh, forceful type of control? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Because if, if the adults who joined, they were all there on their own free will. Uh -huh. um, I think at some point they wanted, some of them probably wanted to leave, but the way a cult works, um, it sort of sneaks up on you. So they, the leader cut them off from society. So isolation was a, a, a big component of the group. Um, but when us kids were born, um, they had to figure out a way to keep us in. And that's when, that's when certain beliefs were developed that, that would give it the characteristics of a cult. Your book is fantastic. 
Thank you. I read this and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm reading this. I'm like, okay, so this girl doesn't have any traditional schooling mm -hmm. until much later in mm -hmm. life. She does not grow up in a traditional uh, educated environment, but she writes <laughs> like she has been writing her entire life. Mm -hmm. You're naturally so talented at writing. I think everyone is. You think everyone yes. is? Well, you haven't read many emails from me then, because I am not very talented at writing. I think what I mean is I think we're all natural storytellers. Uh, and that's yes, what I do I agree was. with that. That's, that's all I did. I, I mean, I, I just had, I, I at some point realized I had memories and I had language. And mm. those were two things that were given to me. Those are two things that are free, you yes. know? And so I, I figured, I mean, it was a very hard book to write. It was by, by no means easy. I know it, it, it can be an easy read, but yeah. they say, Easy reading is damn hard writing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So again, like like most writers would say, it's a lot of sweat, blood, and tears. Yeah. But um, the the actual desire to write just came from this innate human desire to tell a story, and I think that's something that's in all of us. Let's talk about your mother. Okay. Uh, who joined the cult mm -hmm. with your father, or met in the? They met briefly. They met um, not long after joining. Yeah. Yes, and and you write on page seven. You said that same night after she met David, Father mm -hmm. David. She never met him. Or met the teachings the, the, of the, the cult. Yes, the, the members of the group. Yes. yes, so she meets other cult members. That night she left her fiancé and her old life in Sweden to follow this an enigmatic leader and join the eclectic group that called itself the Children of God. I meet very few people who actually leave their fiancés for any reason. Mm. I've never met anyone leave them just like that just like that especially to go to something so life-changing like dedicating mm -hmm. your life to a cult what was it do you think about your mother that made her so infatuated with these people I, I don't think it was just my mother I think it was also the times I mean one thing I always have to clarify when I'm telling my stories that this was well when my mother joined it was the 1970s mm -hmm. but the 1960s I mean people were looking for something different everyone was trying to find new paradigms um, I always say if you grew up in the 60s you didn't really live through it if you didn't join a cult or a band <laughs> yeah. I would have hopefully joined the, the latter um, but it was the thing to do yeah. You know, and I always have to, I feel like I always have to lay that out for people because these days you, you do hear of people joining cults, but in the sixties it was, everyone was joining cults. They were going to music festivals. They were experimenting with drugs. They were really trying to break free of this, this paradigm. You know, it was during the Vietnam war. My uncle left the Vietnam war. He was a, an officer in the Vietnam war to join the children of God. So it was sort of an escape. My mother was, she was Swedish. Um, and she, yeah, she was just sort of a free spirit and was looking for something um, some sort of meaning and purpose, which is one thing a cult does, is it gives people that meaning, that purpose, mm -hmm. that sense of community, that sense of belonging. One thing I always talk about when I talk about cults is is what cults offer to people, you know, because everyone, again, wants to look at the bad parts, you know, the abuse and the terror and the brainwashing. But why are these people doing it? You mm -hmm. know, um, they're well-meaning people and some of them are actually very smart people. I think they're quite idealistic people. Uh, they're very hopeful. They, they, they believe that what they do can change, you know, and that's, that's, that's the kind of people that, that join the children of God. In the 60s, though, you're talking about people joining cults. They weren't knowingly joining a cult. They no. just thought they were joining a good group of people. Nobody joins a cult. Yes. I, I, when I was doing, I did a lot of research when I wrote this book, but there's this great article in Harper's and it starts with those exact words, nobody, nobody joins, joins nobody cult. joins a cult. And yeah. that's why it's important to know the characteristics of a cult, because if you start to see, you know, certain patterns or certain red flags, I mean, it's almost like being in an abusive relationship. No mm -hmm. one jumps in like, I'm going to yes. get with this abusive person and they're going to ruin my life. Can't wait. Of course right. not. Right. They get seduced, you get seduced into it, which is, I think, really important for people to understand. What is or was the overall overall belief system of Children of God? There was a lot. The leader wrote thousands of letters, but I always narrow it down to three main belief systems. Um, one was that the West was evil. So he believed any type of Western thinking. He was very against capitalism, consumerism, any type of political structures, any institutions he was uh, against. The West was evil. The second was uh, the apocalypse was coming. So I don't know exactly when this revelation came to him, but when I was around five, I remember learning that the, the 1993 was the date when the world was going to end. So that sort of created a movement to move everyone out of the West 
before the apocalypse. So that's sort of how I lived my entire childhood in a third world country in Thailand, um, basically kind of preparing for the end of the world, which was coming in 1993. Um, and then the third main belief was um, this kind of free sexual belief that, you know, he was trying to um, kind of marry religion and sex. Mm -hmm. You know, he thought the separation of, of spirituality and the body which, um, which is a, a thing in, in, in the church, you know, this, this idea of guilt and, you know, sort of shun the body to, to serve God. He, he thought that was, was quite damaging. So he sort of capitalized on this idea of sexual repression and um, the young hippies just ate it up. Yeah, the concepts of sex and children of God seem to be all over the place mm -hmm. over the course of time. Yeah. At first it was, no, you can't have sex. Mm -hmm. And then it was, well, we can't have sex. And then it went into even children under the age of 18 could have sex. Mm -hmm. In your time, in your 12 years in the cult, where did you see that degree of sexual freedom? You know, I wasn't that exposed to it, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, I never experienced it, thankfully. Um, I knew about it, so I would, um, I would uh, often just be aware of it. Um, there was a very radical practice he had. I mean, he, he sent the women out to basically prostitute themselves mm -hmm. um, in the name of God. So they would go and they would have sex with men and, um, and receive money. And that was one of his most controversial beliefs. And that's why he lived his entire life in hiding and why most of his followers never saw him or knew what he looked like. Do you know anybody who saw him? Um, I do, yes. I've met a few people who um, who did meet him, yes. And what did they say he was like? An alcoholic. An alcoholic. Which I never knew. I never knew. Yeah. An so, alcoholic, abusive, angry. Yeah. And so growing up, I thought of him as like a big, cuddly kind of teddy bear. Yeah. Um, in fact, in the cover of my book, the, again, this sort of mysterious figure, that's a caricature of him. Um, so in all the pictures, he would white his face out and draw the, the face of a, a kind of like a big, cuddly lion. Right. And that was his, his persona for us. So thousands of people across the world are taking orders from mm -hmm. an angry alcoholic. Yeah, who, who I think his, his, his mystery sort of, um, it sort of added to his allure because the less people knew about him, the more willing they were to believe him because it was this this mysterious person you know he kept himself out of reach and that just made it was he, i always say he's sort of like this oz like figure mm -hmm. you know so everyone is constantly trying to please him and everything he said was basically kind of like the law mm -hmm. you know we had to follow it we weren't allowed to speak against anything he said and yeah i think it actually added to his to his uh his control that he had over his when Always. you were a child, did you want to see him? No. No? No. So w I think what? I was just sort of like, kind of, maybe a little scared of him. But yeah, I had no desire to see him. But you believed he was the word of God. Um, I think I was, I, could, I had no choice to believe otherwise. So, I mean, I would listen, we would hear tape recordings of, of him, you know, telling stories. And yeah, I had no choice to really believe. But I don't think I was... As children, you're not really forming your own belief system. Mm -hmm. So I just, you, I just had to go along with, you know, what everyone taught me. And you obviously didn't have anything to compare that to. So for you, that was just that life. was Yeah, that was my normal. Yeah. Yes. How many different places did you live throughout your childhood? I think I mentioned this somewhere in my book, but at one point I remember being 12 and counting about 24 different places. You were 12 years old and mm -hmm. you had lived... 24 places. I believe so, yes. That's counting like various campgrounds. Sure. Um, I was born in Sweden, moved to Mexico when I was six months, came to California when I turned one, lived kind of all over Southern and Central California, and then moved to Thailand when I was four, and then moved all over Thailand. So we were living in, you know, the rural, northern, beautiful countryside, Bangkok, um, the southern tropical islands. Um, but yeah, we were constantly on the move and we were taught as children that um, we were escaping the Antichrist, this, this kind of Antichrist that we didn't quite know who it was. So Father David's um, mission was to find the Antichrist, basically. Um, and so 
I find out later that really we were on the run because our activities were a little suspicious and, you know, people were, were like, what's, what's this big house? We lived communally, so there was like 30 to 40 people, you know, living in these big houses in these like rural areas, a bunch of foreigners. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we were kind of constantly like on the run to just kind of keep out of reach of, of the officials. As a child, did you think that was bizarre? I thought it was kind of exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I had doubts as a child. I think a big part of it kicked in when I would, I would see things happening to my siblings. And it was sort of like this maternal instinct of like, this is wrong. This is, this should not be happening. But as far as like the movement, um, we would, we would get up and, and, and leave constantly. And I, I think I just, I kind of found a thrill in it. I think as an adult, I can see more how it can be upsetting for a child not to have a permanent, like I still to this day, I don't know what it's like to have like a home. You mm -hmm. know, I never had a home as a child. Like we, we called ourselves gypsies. We were constantly moving. Mm -hmm. But no, it was it was kind of thrilling for me, I guess, as a child. Yeah, you, you, that comes across in your book. Yeah, uh, yeah. There was this excitement, mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll talk about this in future sessions, but your desire as a child to just have that quality time with your family yeah. was so real. Yeah. I don't care if you grew up in a cult or if you lived a lavish life in Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. all children want and I think need yeah to feel that security, safety, priority, that bonding with their family. It's funny, I'm in, in school right now and I, I'm, I can't help but keep dissecting this, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of coming at it from a more theor theoretical perspective. And um, one, one of Father David's techniques, whether it was knowing or unknowing, I don't know how much of this he actually consciously did or if it was just a way for him but he really thought this was God's will, but it was to break down the family unit. Um, so he saw the family, the, the nuclear family as an impediment to God's work. So we were always separated. We weren't really allowed to have those like tight family bonds, you know, that most people hopefully have, which not everyone has. Mm -hmm. But then he created this sort of facade of like, oh, this is this is your family, you know, this is this is your your new family, and that was again his way of, of kind of keeping control over his his followers. Do you believe that he believed what he was doing? That's a good question, and that's something I still I, I'm trying to uncover, and I I, I want to write more. I want to write more about like the how and the why of it, yeah. like how did this happen and why? How did he control? What were the techniques he used? I don't think I'll ever know if he was consciously doing it. Like if he was sitting, I think this is the thing I, I face is that people, I, I, I talk a lot about this stuff, so I'm, I'm sorry if I kind of seem like all over the place, but um, the easy answer would be bad leader, dumb people, right? Yes. That's the easy answer. That's easy. Yep. That's the answer the media wants. Yep. It's a lot more complex than that. Um, so I think, I don't know if Father David knew what he was doing consciously. Um, I think on some level he believed it was God's work, but I think at some point it's the guilt started to eat away at him and he died a year after his predicted apocalypse. So I think he just at some point realized whatever he was teaching these people wasn't coming to pass, you know, and he did ruin a lot of lives. Have you heard of the just world theory? No. Um, one of our med circle doctors, Dr. Eret, discusses the just world theory in a series we did on PTSD and people who've suffered sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. And the theory basically says that we project mm -hmm. our own um, ideas onto people to keep our world safe. Mm -hmm. So when people hear that your parents raised you and your 11 brothers and sisters in a cult. It, to your point, the easy answer would be, well, that guy is bad mm -hmm. and those people are dumb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That way I'm protecting myself yes. because I'm not dumb and yeah. I don't associate with bad exactly. people. So that could never happen to me. Mm -hmm. But if you've watched anything on cults and organizational, you know, communicating in, the, in this form and yeah. structures, yeah. It can happen to anybody. Yeah. It, it is not something that can only affect a specific group of people. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, 
when I when I did start to sort of unpack and and research and study my past, basically, I think it was a hard realization. And even to this day, it, it, it makes it a little difficult. If you grew up in like sort of like a traditional abusive, whatever that means, but like <laughs> a tradition, traditional you know, those abuse, normal abusive those, normal, those normal family yeah. abuse scenarios where you have the abusive alcoholic father who mm -hmm. beats you and mm -hmm. the, the absent, you know, drunk mother, you know, you, you have these bad people to blame. I have Father David, but I never met him. And a lot of the followers, they were actually very, like I said before, s smart, well-meaning people, kind of ideal, uh, idealistic. Um, I listened to a podcast on this group and, and their sort of conclusion, conclusion of it all was that the downfall of the children of God was they were tragically hopeful, which I thought was a great way to put it. And it kind of, it's kind of a wake up call because it, it's like this, this idea, the idealism can lead you down a very dangerous path. Yes. And I think this group was a, a, a sign of that. When you were in Thailand, where you spent most of your time with children of God, mm -hmm. it seemed like that's also when the children of God was at its peak. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, it could be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, it went through phases, yes. like, like any movement organization. So I always think of there were the early days, there were the sort of the strict days, and then there was the falling apart of yes. the whole thing. So yeah, I grew up during these, it was all about the children, all about training us to be these basically end time soldiers. End time end soldiers. End time, yeah. And what does a day look like for a child being trained to become an end time soldier? Yeah, it was very regimented. So it was, I mean, we were constantly being watched from, you know, the time we woke up to the time we went to bed. Um, we didn't have a traditional schooling. So um, we would uh, definitely hear a lot of Father David's teachings, you know, in the morning we would have uh, what we called get out. So we were able to go outside and play and, um, and yeah, just like the standard three meals a day and, you know, just nap time and things like that. But as far as the day to day, I think what was missing was definitely schooling um, and time with family. So we, I, I didn't really hardly see my parents. Um, sometimes I would, but yeah, I was constantly like longing for them. Well, you mentioned earlier that Father David during one point of uh, the children of God's existence in Thailand would uh, promote and encourage women to go out and become quote unquote hookers for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Those were his terms, yeah. his words. And everyone just said, yeah, that sounds yeah. like a good plan. Father David, what was, how did he view women? It was weird. It was sort of this, this contradiction. Cause on the one hand, he sort of, I don't know if it was just his own obsession, but he, he would even say like the most beautiful thing in creation is a woman, almost like he was worshiping the woman. Um, but then at the same time, he thought women, I guess, should use their, he thought the woman's body was a manifestation of God's love. So he had this very, I guess you'd call it unique perspective of, of God and sex. Um, or at least this is what he's telling people. Yeah, this is what he's telling right. people. Um, but he did, he very much glorified the woman. So he wasn't, he wasn't like you know, putting women down or thinking he was better. In fact, in some ways he was like, women are superior. And in fact, there was a whole dissertation written on the structure of the children of God and the way women were actually required to be in leadership positions in the children of God. And they, they're saying these, uh, whoever wrote the dissertation said, that's the reason why the group stayed for so long and kept going for so long was because they had a little more um, balance and power. Um, I don't know if that's true, but, uh, he, he did have this sort of, it was like sort of a dichotomy in his mm -hmm. belief of, or his view of, of the woman. You lived as a child with this knowing that by the age of 12 in 1993, you would be dead mm -hmm. with your friends, mm -hmm. with your siblings, along with your parents and mm -hmm. everybody else in the children of God. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much that you were afraid of dying and going to heaven mm -hmm. so much as what you would die from, how you would die. Yeah. And I think people probably have a, uh, a similar fear mm -hmm. when they get older in life mm -hmm. and they start to think about their own death. Mm -hmm. But I've never talked to an eight year old mm -hmm. with them even having the concept that people die. Mm -hmm. Yet here you were mm -hmm. as a child mm -hmm. knowing that this is what your destiny was. Mm -hmm. How how do you 
How does that affect you? You mean now or then? Both. <laughs> I don't know. I think I thought of some really serious things as a child, you know, but again, very real things. Everyone's going to die. It's like one, one, one certain that we all have is we're all going to die. And I just had to think of it at a very young age. People are asking me recently, like, how, how has this affected you now? And I think, I think one of the side effects of it was we weren't taught to plan for the future. So I grew up never knowing, never knowing I would even be a woman. Um, we weren't taught to make, you know, long-term plans. Um, I had this really interesting realization recently. My, my last grandparent just died and I never knew her. So I wasn't really grieving as much as more just like processing like, oh, wow. Okay. So now it's my parents and then it's me. And I was like, why am I not reacting to this? And I realized that as a child, I never had an elderly figure in my life mm. because all the members were young and yeah. then there were children. Mm. And then father David was this enigmatic lion over there. Right. I never even like touched, held the hand of an old person. So I think this idea of getting old and growing old is something that most people just, it's just seeing an old person, seeing, you know, the wrinkles and seeing the white hair and you realize, oh, one day I'm going to be that, you know, and then thinking about the future and how you're going to plan for that. Um, that was just something that was never in my, in my psyche. I never thought of that. And so what do you think the implications of not thinking about that has, does for you now? I don't know, <laughs> to be yeah. honest. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how anyone would know. You know, yeah. it's such a unique uh, situation to be in. You say on page 46, when a child is forced to think about death, they don't think about what will happen in the afterlife. They think about the exact moment of death and what must happen for a person to die. Mm -hmm. Did all of the sibling, all of your siblings and all the children have that same thought? No, no. I was, I was shocked to know that I had this very unique sort of obsession over it. I think some did. I talked to my cousin and he said he was, he was like, yeah, Floor, I was always thinking about that too. But most, I think most kids, we were caught up in this very kind of social, you know, excitement constantly. But I, I think I just, my mind took to this idea of like, hey guys, we're going to die. Right. Um, does anyone know what this <laughs> means? Should we talk about that? This is yeah. a physiological thing. So I just, somehow the way I process it, even I have an identical twin sister and she oh. wasn't thinking about these things. So no, not everyone processed it the same way. I just, maybe it was the morbid creative part of my brain that wanted to like, you know, build a story. I was building my own narrative back then. You, I mean, obviously I've never met anyone else from the children of God, mm -hmm. at least that I know of. You seem different though. I just a though. bunch of them in Oceanside. They, where you, <laughs> yeah. Are they really? Oh. A bunch of my cousins live right around here. I probably, <laughs> hey, come say hi next time. Um, but you, you do seem like you had a different perspective than the other kids, just based from the book, which I know is, mm. is, is biased, but it seemed like you had an awareness mm. that maybe the other kids did not have. Possibly. I, that's another question I don't know that I can answer. I think I was always very observant. Um, so I think a natural tendency would to be to get involved. And I, I just, like when I wrote the book, it literally felt like I had this movie that had played throughout my childhood and I, all I had to do was sort of paint the picture. Um, I don't know if that's because I was forced to qu sort of be quiet. You know, you tell someone to shut up and sit down, they're just going to sit and watch. And that's mm -hmm. what I did. Mm -hmm. I sat and I watched what was going on around me. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I haven't talked to enough of the other children to, to know what their experience was. Um, uh, how are your relationships with your siblings? Um, some of them are good. Um, you know, I always, people always want to know how my family's doing because there's mm -hmm. a lot of us. Some of them are doing great and some of them aren't doing so great. And mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to watch sometimes, but, um, I, I learned that, you know, kind of like you have to save yourself. You have to do what you can do. And, you know, we all came from the same, you know, environment, the same background. And I think it just goes to show, I mean, everyone reacted to it differently. And I, I think some people are maybe more vulnerable or, you know, they just maybe take it in a more traumatic way. Um, not to say that there wasn't trauma for me. It was, mm -hmm. it was traumatic in its own way, but, um, I don't know. I think like my mom would always say, like, I was born to be a fighter. Or I, I was, I just, I had to do something with what I had been given. And I, I had to not look at it as sort of a burden or, or something bad. I, I think I learned 
quite quickly the importance of perspective. Mm. You know, if I let this childhood, if I, if I let it cloud my perspective, or if I, if I choose to play victim, there's no end to how far I could go with it. You know, um, and instead I decided to, to make something of it. And I continue to make something of it. You know, I want to continue to write. And That's a really good line about being a victim. Mm -hmm. There's no limit there would be to how no far end. you could go. Yeah. I mean, because I could blame my everything. everything. Oh, I grew up, I don't have a childhood. I, I really didn't have a family. I never had a future. I was supposed to die. I mean, a lot of kids did commit suicide. They just, they couldn't deal with this world. Like, it wasn't even so much the childhood. It was the change of being in this completely isolated world, almost like in an incubator. Like we were completely sheltered from right. everything, from media, education, institution, um, social, you know, obligations, everything. And then we were just sort of all of a sudden dumped into to reality. And that was the hard part, comprehending all that. Is there anything you left out of your book? Well, I've lived a whole life since then. That's what I always <laughs> tell people. This book, I wrote it, I started writing it when I was, um, well, it took me 12 years, but I started writing it quite young and I, I knew where the ending was, but since then I've, you know, and I, I do plan to write more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of scenes were, were cut or, you know, in the end, I think it, it, with the work of my agent editing it, we found what was most important. And, you know, I went through it so many times and it was, it was the story that I wanted to tell. Fantastic. Well, we will continue this conversation with Laura Edwards growing up in a cult and the implications regarding that in our next session.